The concept of love and relationships in the modern era is incredibly difficult. Um, I don't think we understand what love is. I think we have been told what love is. Um, we have been conditioned to believe whatever the narrative is, whether you are watching TV, movies, some are romantic comedy, you know, uh, or Ashton Kutcher, whether you are following on Instagram, this whole narrative of what love is, and I think that's where we are getting it wrong. I think we are being sold what a relationship should look like. Um, it's not natural. Most of us are struggling in relationships um, because we're trying to do things that we don't understand. Uh, we've been given a Western model of what a relationship is, very detached from the principles in which we have been brought up with um, growing up in Africa. You watch Brooke Logan, you watch Taylor, you watch Rich in The Bold and the Beautiful, and they give you their view on what a relationship is. Um, they, they, they sell the concept of love where you celebrate Valentine's Day with a bouquet of roses. That is what we now see as affection or um, acts of love. You know, we're being sold these love languages uh, from Western thinkers, and we're trying to plug that in in African context um, about what love is, about what relationships are, and we are struggling. We go into relationships as, as fickle, hurt, broken individuals, yearning for someone else to, to, to complete us. Um, not understanding a good team. We first need to fix ourselves. Uh, and an example is if I come from a relationship where there was an extreme infidelity, for example, and I've got trust issues, I will carry that into my next relationship. Um, and I will burden my partner with the task of having to fix that. Um, a lot of people go into relationships and they are in a financial disarray and they put pressure on their partners to pay rent, cell phone contracts, school fees, whatever the case may be, um, because they are carrying those negative aspects into the relationship, and that puts strain on relationships. Uh, we go into relationships having expectations of love. This is what love looks like for me. You are tasked with the responsibility of showing that love. If showing that love is cooking for me, if showing that love is spending time with me, I go and I put that on you. Um, and if you don't do it, then you don't love me. Um, if you don't show me this, then you don't care. So in 2022, I think we need to take a step back from what we've been told love is. Uh, we need to take a step back into what we have been told relationships are and do a deep dive in who we are uh, and what we are needing in order to best maneuver the challenges of, of, of the world. Try and see the shortfalls of what you thought love was. Um, try and see the shortfalls in what you thought relationships are. Try and Fix you, try and love you, try and make sure what you should you get into a relationship, you go into a relationship healthy, mentally, psychologically, you go into a relationship healthy, physically, we go definitely financially, you go into a relationship so that you don't strain your partner uh, in what you want or what you say you need. Um, you have self-love. You understand what that means for you outside of what social media is saying, outside of what uh, TV is telling you. You know what love is for yourself um, so that you don't put unnecessary strain and pressure on your partner. And I truly believe, Uguzi, once you have fixed your broken wings and once you have saved yourself in that space, 
then going into a relationship, um, there's a higher chance of success. That is my understanding of 2022 love and relationships. So the first girl that actually blew my mind, I was in grade, a crash, and it was an Afrikaans girl. I'll never, I can't remember her name, but she blew my mind. And it just speaks to the conditioning, uh, what we had seen as an idea of beauty, or what we have been told. Blonde, blue eyes, and the fact that I was in a time, or I grew up in a time where black people were very segregated from white people. Very, very segregated. And we played in our own spaces, and even the white teachers wouldn't touch us. Uh, as how teachers would, you know, love and appreciate little kids. And we were secluded from that. And I'll never forget, I used to have a Afrikaans friend called Morne. And Morne comes to me the one time and he tells me, Guti, this one girl likes me, you know. And uh, I'm busy with my black friends and my, you know, in my racial corner and... I remember how she came up to me and, you know, she knew my name. To this day, I can't even remember what her name was. She knew my name and she, in the thickest Afrikaans accent, said that I'm, um, I'm very pretty and she wants to be my girlfriend. And the pressure of that, you know, but that blew my mind. Um, and that stuck with me. And for the longest time, I've never brought it into my forefront because there was so much guilt at the fact that the first person that actually made my heart beat was a white girl. And I've been guilty. And I felt like I've let a black generation down. But with time, I've forgiven myself because I understood the journey that I was put on. I understood where I was, where we all are. Um, fast forward to my high school. Uh, my first significant relationship was with a lady from a ladysmith. Uh, I, we were the same age, and uh, I was in grade 11. And end of grade, my end of grade 10 year, going to my grade 11 year, end of her grade 9 year, going to grade 10. But we were the same age because I was a year younger um, than my peers. And she was skin tone as dark as the night. And I love that so much. I loved how dark she was. Selfishly, it made people, black people see you, Guti, I can be attracted to someone that dark. Um, because of how I look, my light skin, my hair, you have people putting on these expectations on you, Guti. You now need to date someone who is light-skinned, uh, or because of how I can, my tone when I speak is Nghisi, people say, oh, you must be dating a white person or at least a colored person, you know? And the fact that I dated a lady who was as Zulu as they come um, with the skin tone and how she carried herself proudly Zulu, proudly black, you know, it also allowed me to show who I was. And then you start realizing what he, it, it, it speaks to a deeper level than just relationships. And the person that you are with speaks to who you are. Studying at uh, Rhodes University um, in my first year, in the second day that I was there, I was approached. We were sitting in a very popular uh, uh, watering hole called the Rat and Parrot. And I'll never forget, we're sitting there with my friends who were all black and this white lady comes up to me and says, I think you very good looking, you know, again, being brought up in very, very racial Newcastle where white people are on the one side and black people on the other side. It took me aback like when I had to kind of manage that situation. Um, but then I got to find who I was. I got to start dating or having situationships, I think that's the new term, with ladies from all corners, tall, short, fat, skinny, light, dark, and you started, or I started rather, embracing um, women in my life and what and how they made 
me feel and what they brought up and um, made me understand better who I am and not having to prove who I am, whether I'm dating someone who is my age to, I don't have to prove who to know or having to date someone who's significantly younger. Um, I don't have, it's nothing that I need to prove. It no longer speaks to an insecurity or su superiority, whether I'm dating someone who's dark, whether I'm dating someone who is light, um, whether I'm dating someone who's tall, whether I'm dating someone who's short. I've, I've, I feel like I've transcended that to a point where now the way that I view relationships to me speaks to someone that I'm happy to walk through the challenges of life rather than someone who is here to fill up lang shota corner and where I'm where I fall short uh, because I'm dark and ugly I feel like I need to get someone who's light and pretty or whether I'm short and fat I need to get someone who's tall and slender maybe financially I'm broke so I need to date a girl who is comes from a very financially strong family I no longer need to do that um, whereas for the longest time in my early development, I think subconsciously or unconsciously, a lot of my decisions around dating and being in relationship uh, had, had connotations of that. So that is my experience in relationship from the first relationship um, that I ever experienced. <laughs> The three funniest people that I've experienced. So, um, growing up in, in a relatively small town, well, I, when I grew up, it was a very, very small town. And there's only so many ways that um, you could entertain yourself. And Mund was extremely blessed to experience different people uh, and, and learn and drink and get entertained from different guys. Um, so, we used to have, not used to, but Kodum Chita, uh, so a red dog, Uchilis, Pele Pele. Unati is shout out Nati. He's probably the funniest human being I've ever come across. Um, he's funny when you don't know who he is. He's funny when you know who he is. He's funny when you are expecting him to be funny. He's funny when you are not expecting him to be funny. Um, I think. A lot of the funny guys that I know are extremely intelligent and their timing of humor is so impeccable. Unati had a way to make Amachita, who Amachita Sekasi, laugh. And he had a way to make us who grew up in a suburban way laugh. And he could hit the same joke packaged in a different way to make us laugh to a point where you can't breathe. Unati used to make us laugh in the most inappropriate times in the classroom. He used to make us laugh in the hall. He used to make us laugh on the playground. Um, he used to make bullies laugh. He used to make girls laugh. Um, Unati, without a shadow of a doubt, is the funniest human being I have ever come across. I've never come across a human being who's made me laugh to a point where I have real anxiety and fear over my health because I cannot breathe and my body is moving in a way where I don't know what my anus and my penis will do at the same time. So shout out Chilis, um, Saktan, Damganami, please wherever you are, I hope you're making Amajita laugh. Number two on my list is a brother and a friend of mine, Uprin and Gavinda, another incredibly talented, incredibly smart individual. Um, Uprenden, one of his biggest strengths is what you see may not be what you get. So he's a huge buff guy, he loves gym, you know, um, very, very alpha. And how he carries himself in spaces where people don't know him, he's relatively reserved. Um, but to people who are within his circle, I, I don't know, he's got this ability to just press play. And because he's so talented, he's got so many different personas that he can then pull, you know, whether he's making 
uh, not so inappropriate racial jokes or whether he's making jokes around certain personalities. He's got a talent to imitate voice and mannerisms like no other. Um, I know people will talk about your Trevor Noahs or these guys. I rate to Brendan higher than them, higher than the best uh, stand-up comedians. This guy will take you out of the worst depression that you've ever gone into and literally have you on the floor laughing. You'll be in absolute stitches. Um, you'll get to a point where you've forgotten about the challenges and the hardships of life. And I was incredibly, incredibly privileged to go through a lot of challenges in high school with him right next to me. Um, where I feel he's, he separates himself from the rest is as funny as he is, when shit hits the fan, he's right next to you and you can always count on him um, when times are hard. Third is a whole lot of individuals that have played a, a, a role in my life uh, in terms of being funny. From Varsity days, I had a really good friend of mine, Caleb Koranteng, shout out Caleb. Um, my brother, Uzamani Ngumalo, uh, friends like Uzamami, and these are guys who are, again, incredibly smart, incredibly talented, uh, but have a way of softening any hard space with humor, you know, um, being able to manipulate the room and have impeccable timing uh, in how they deliver the humor. It's very different. Caleb Kuranteng, for example, um, has a, a, a very, uh, for lack of a better word, English type of humor where it's very sarcastic. If you're not at a certain level, you might miss it. Um, Uzama Mieni, he's very boichi slash intellectual with his humor. Um, Uzaman is very aggressive with his humor. So it hits differently uh, at different times. So that third spot is a three-way tie between uh, those three guys. But those guys have been just amazing um, in my life. And I'm truly, truly blessed to have experienced those three guys. Um, if I had to sit down and think, I'd probably name 20 other gents um, that have been amazing, including celebrities um, that I've watched. Bernie Mac, example, as a stand-up comedian. But in terms of my life and the roles that those people have played in my life and in my journey, again, Truly appreciative. Thank you so much, Majita. And wherever you guys are, I hope um, as much as I take you very, very seriously, I hope every now and again you don't take yourselves too seriously to a point where you forget the talent that you have in um, relieving stress and making us have a lack of chuckle. <laughs>